Hey guys, it's Gary. Um, coming here today. I have some problems with my setup here with the microphone. Um, so uh, I got a few attempts going here to try to record something. Let's see if this one works. Um, I'm here today mainly because uh, I've been feeling guilty about not doing any videos. I don't have an excuse. I'm not working. Um, I just I, I got sidetracked by uh, VCLT stuff coming along. Um, and I guess I kind of feel that, um, you know, I've got, I've got some ideas of people I want to do like Harold Weiss, but I don't want to do them until I have copious notes and, uh, which causes me to have to listen to this stuff in great detail and take notes. And uh, I'm like 75% there. And then I just kind of drop it. Well, whatever. So, um, I got a bunch of VCLT, which, which I, I did videos on. I've been listening to that stuff. And, um, you know, going through my archives, my boxes here, as I do several times a week, um, I find myself uh, going through um, my various containers full of CDs and vinyl. The vinyl, um, I've pretty much gone through all of it because uh, just from looking through the things that I've shown in earlier videos, so I pretty much know what I have, but I have so many more CDs. And I've only got some of them kind of together in, in groups um, when I was lucky enough to find most of the ECM artists. I found all the individual CDs I have, so I keep them together in cases. Um, but I actually have plastic storage bins just full of stuff that's not really sorted in any fashion. So I come across things that I've forgotten about and things that I want to listen to and uh, whatever. And I end up by, oh, gee, I haven't heard this for a long time. And I end up pulling various things. And I'm probably going to do a lot more of these videos because um, it's kind of hard and time consuming in, in terms of preparation to do an artist profile. Um, I've done probably most of the artists that I know a lot about. And um, I see somebody I forgot, but I'm going to, I think I'm going to go off screen and grab them. So anyway, um, what I thought I'd show today, and I haven't, don't think I've really done this much before, is to show the things that I've pulled recently that I've come across and unfortunately, some things I bought, which I shouldn't be spending money. And um, what I've been listening to, besides the VCLT that I got, various things. And um, just going through my, my various storage bins uh, full of um, CDs, I've come across a lot of the classical stuff, which is com almost completely, totally unsorted. And I'm happy to go through it because, you know, I tend to forget about a lot of the things that I have. And uh, when I see them, it's like, wow, I either don't remember what it sounds like or I want to hear it again. Now, largely because uh, for the first time I've been writing music using uh, a software, sequencer program. And initially when I started using it, uh, when I, I bought it a couple a year, year or two ago initially, um, and I couldn't figure it out, but I was working then. So I didn't really honestly put much time into it. About six weeks or so ago, um, I decided, ah, let me see if I can get anything out of this. And my initial idea was to um, just record a, a, a couple simple sequencer phrases that w were repetitive, like you've heard in, you know, music, you know, pretty much since the 70s, um, especially electronic music, and create a couple um, sequencer patterns, maybe to um, record synthesizer stuff over playing on the keyboards. Um, after I worked, I spent some time working on the program, I actually started figuring things out. And um, I, I came up with a concept for a, a new album and everything. And um, as always happens, I have the concept, but the music itself changes greatly. So by the time the music comes out, it it's, um, bears little resemblance to what I thought it was going to end up sounding like. And that's because I was able to figure out um, a great deal of things in the sequencer program and decided that I would go that route. And um, instead of just using the sequencer to create kind of um, a, a, a rhythmic um, sequencer phrase that I would solo over, like you've heard on the, you know, the 70s, especially the Berlin artists, um, I, I started realizing the capabilities of, of what was in there and um, started listening to uh, the classical um, sounds that were capable in the software, which is incredible orchestra stuff, French horns, uh, French horns, which I love. Um, 
and ended up instead of doing um, an electronic oriented thing, uh, ended up writing, um, well, starting anyway, um, a piece almost entirely based on um, sounds, orchestral sounds. Um, so my concept for the album was always going to be two very long pieces. They were both going to be electronic synthesizer pieces. And now I think I'm going to do um, one of each. I think I'm going to do a really long synthesizer piece and another uh, piece, which is going to be surprising because it's going to sound almost totally orchestral. And um, so I've been, I've been it, but a lot more time consuming than I anticipated because I had a concept for two different albums. And one of them was going to be all hands on playing that was going to consist of multiple, multiple parts that I knew would take a long time to record. And then I got the idea of doing a, an album of two very long pieces. I'm thinking about like 30 minutes each, somewhere in there. Um, and I thought, well, that'll go a lot quicker than this other piece. But then, you know, once I get into it, um, I'm really looking to put something out that's not... Uh, I'm not going to record it just because I think it's faster. And what happened is um, I thought it would be quicker to do these two long pieces. But then when I got into the software and I realized how um, complex I could get with it, I decided, um, well, you know, this is going to take a lot longer than I anticipated it would. But I want to put out something that is worth listening to and, um, you know, hopefully something that would stand up that you could go back to 10 years from whenever it's released and listen to it and it's still valid. Um, I'm not just going to do a, an album with two long pieces because it's quicker than the first concept I had. Um, so I, you know, I do, I do put a lot of effort into, into this stuff, which is why I don't really record much. Um, so I've been working on that and to that end because I uh, discovered the orchestral capabilities of using the software. I needed, um, well, I, I wanted inspiration and um, the best place because I'm not using, you know, standard guitar, bass, drums, sounds. Um, so I started listening to uh, classical music, not to rip it off or steal themes or ideas or anything. Honestly, I couldn't even do it if I tried, um, but rather to listen to arrangements, uh, orchestral colors, how instruments blend. Um, how you could go from one movement to another type of type of thing, um, you know, because classical music isn't based really on, on rhythms so much. Uh, you know, it's fairly easy to write a consistent rhythm and find something interesting to, to put over on that rhythm. And even though the, the part that I'm writing does have some kind of cellos chugging along there, um, that pr provides a constant rhythm. I, there's going to probably be some sections in there that don't have so much of a noticeable rhythm. So I started really um, wanting to hear and to get inspired by um, classical music. And just going through my bins, um, I started I started finding things. Now, the first thing I started listening to, just because I haven't listened to it for a while, I may have shown this at some point, and it's not actually orchestral, it's um, solo piano, but it's uh, Fred, I think his first name is Frederico. Frederico Mompau, a Spanish composer who died in, uh, born 1893, died in 1987, so fairly long life. Um, and I got to admit, when I bought this a few years ago, I knew nothing about him. And this is one of those buys. I mean, I knew it was classical music. I knew it was classical piano. Um, I had, I had, <laughs> sucker, I got, I got sucked in by the album cover, which I loved. And, and also, uh, this is a four CD set. And when I saw the album cover, I started reading about the composer. And what I liked about it was the fact that, um, unlike a lot of classical piano music, uh, people said it was kind of almost like the ambient music of, his, of its time. Now, you really can't compare it to the Harold Budd kind of Brian Eno, which is very quiet, slow moving stuff. Um, it is, after all, essentially a classical type composer. So it is, the music is busier than that. Um, but compared to, you know, the Chopin's or the Beethoven's or, or whoever you would listen to, um, in terms of, uh, classical piano, it's more spacious than that. And people had reviewed it and I, and I read about him and it's like, okay, I'll buy it. I don't know anything about the guy. Sounded interesting. Uh, classical's really the one field that, um, I'm fairly clueless in. 
and I love the cover. I guess I got I got it a decent price, but not a steal. Uh, four CD set, over an hour for each disc. The thing that really clinched the deal for me was um, it's almost all of the solo piano works that Mompau wrote himself, and uh, it was recorded in 1974 by the composer himself. To me, that makes a big deal. Uh, people did comment on this particular album, and it's true that the recorded quality isn't as good as some other um, recordings of Mompau's solo piano music that were done by other uh, classical musicians. But for me, it makes a big difference and a big deal that it's the composer himself playing his own music versus, um, you know, a traditionally trained classical pianist who's basically reading, you know, reading music off, off the paper and not uh, not putting any of himself into it, really. In Mompau's case, he wrote it so he could change it even as he's playing it. Um, so the recording is is good. It's it's um, it's not bad. It's from '74, so it's not ancient. Um, but there's um, you hear times when his his foot taps, for instance, um, on the uh, you know on the floor as he's playing the piano. Uh, but I think if somebody said um, it's not like you have to. There's a warning saying, oh, by the way, you know, it's good music, but it's not recorded well. It's not It's not like that at all. It's just that, and I do have one other single disc recording of Mom Pow Works that was done, I think, uh, I think later on, probably in the 90s, um, of, of, you know, a bunch of the works that are on here. And, yeah, it, it, it sounds better, but it's done by some guy that's just reading it off the, the, the paper. Um, so, uh, you know, it's nice to have a fair, this is almost everything that Mom Pow wrote for solo piano. And um, if you've heard Debussy or Satie, who's probably the only other guys kind of in this um, slightly quieter classical mode, um, you know, he might be a good guy to check out. Uh, like I said, maybe Satie uh, and Debussy may be a little quieter than this, but he's a Spanish composer and he's got a little bit of that, of that flavor in there too, um, which, which I like. And it's a long disc, and when I put the when I put the discs into copy for my computer, which is where I always listen to them, none of the titles came up, and I and um, I don't know. There's like thirty thirty five titles on each CD, in in Spanish, which I don't speak. And I sat there and I manually typed in every single title of the piece. So I really put an effort in to get this in the computer because it just came up as track one, track two, and four CDs worth of stuff. Um, so that's one of the things I've been listening to, which is something I've had for a few years. Um, and then when it comes to orchestral music that I um, kind of, I would say randomly, it's just like, well, I haven't listened to this for a while. Um, I selected a bunch of things. Um, and here's another album that I bought a number of years ago, uh, five, six years ago, by somebody else that I had, a composer I'd never heard of, and probably no one else either has, uh, Wilhelm Peterson Berger. Uh, a Nordic, I guess, um, composer. And this is um, a CD. This is one of the ones that I knew I was buying classical orchestral music, which I wanted. But how did I choose this CD? Once again, I, I suckered. I let I, I was a sucker. I let the cover make the decision for me. Uh, it was also at a budget price. New. And, uh, you know, I wanted orchestral music at the time. I wanted to uh, hear something by a composer that I didn't know. And, um, you know, it fits the bill. It's, it's very conservative, traditional um, music by his composer who died in 1942. Not very well known. Um, and it looks like, where is it recorded? Definitely Nordic, definitely one of the Nordic countries. Uh, Sweden, maybe? Um, I don't know, no, 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 no. German? No, disc is made in Germany. Um, but it's another thing. You know, it's not avant-garde music at all. Uh, it's just one of those things I listen to um, to appreciate the orchestra. And it's a fairly, you know, fairly new recording. It's not old. It's from, uh, oh, 99. So it's pretty, very recent in the classical world. So it sounds good. I got suckered in by the cover. Why not? You know, I'm, if I'm going to buy something by somebody I don't know and I don't know what to get, you got to let something help you make the decision. And uh, same thing here. Is uh, now Dvorak, which is a very well-known classical composer, and I've got a few discs by him, um, including I didn't have his most famous work, the New World uh, Symphony, though, uh, until I received it as VCLT, 
and I had actually forgotten that I had another Dvorak CD. It doesn't have New World Symphony on it. Um, but uh, Axel in Germany actually sent me the uh, New World Symphony CD, which I've been listening to. But um, I have another one, which has a, another symphony of his by. And it's not the cover so much that I let um, make the decision for me when I bought this a few years ago. Uh, there's a track on here called The Noon Witch. And I'm always on the lookout because Halloween is like my favorite time of year. Uh, and I love that 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 um, visual, what you, visual vibe of, of Halloween. And I uh, was looking for like classical music that could be uh, or has been, in fact, used uh, in movies and in Hollywood for a lot of years and things that, um, you know, can be seen as kind of spooky or have a subject matter. Um, there's some famous uh, Russian composers that wrote um, classical music based on traditional Russian witch stories and things like that, even though there's no lyrics or anything in them. And uh, with a title like The Noon Witch, Witch, I just had to get it. It just happened to be Dvorak. And, you know, it's a full orchestral piece. I think this might be the only other album besides the one that Axel sent me that I have of just Dvorak works. I have his works on compilation CDs by, you know, multiple composers. But I think this is only the, the second um, Dvorak I have. And The Noon Witch isn't a, a, anything I've ever, I'd ever heard of before. So uh, that's one that I booked because of the cover. And I came across this one the other day. Uh, Handel's Water Music, which is uh, no big deal. It's a nice cover. The, the, the thing that I like about this, it's only a 43-minute CD. Um, it only has just water music on only one track. It's not broken up into movement, into movements or anything. And you see it's one of those little single, um, what do you call it? Cardboard single cases. And the reason that, that I pulled this out, besides I hadn't heard the full water music in years, um, was this was the first classical C CD, not the first classical album, but the first classical CD I ever bought. CDs were very new at the time. And there were no budget CDs because they hadn't been out. So every album that was coming out, whether it was a new album or, you know, a reissue of an old vinyl album, were coming out at full price. And I was shopping at the CD store, and this would have been the late 80s, I don't know, 86 or so. And they had this on the stand. They had a bunch of these uh, on the stand at the checkout counter. And at that time, buying a new CD for $3.69. A new sealed CD, obviously a budget because there's no case on there. It's just the thing, um, just the, the, the cardboard slip case here. Um, on this, but $3.69 for a CD when they were all going for at least $13.99. Um, it was like, well, what the hell? That's cheap. I don't have any classical CDs. And it was, you know, the really good first listen to. Um, you know, some fairly quiet orchestral music in the CD medium, whereas all the other stuff I had was on LP, and, you know, LP's a little noisy, especially in classical music, uh, when you have um, very quiet mo movements and you hear the turntable rumble and the clicks and the pops. So even though the CD's quite short at only 37 and a half minutes, um, and I don't know anything about this label, but it was apparently a French label, uh, Music Dior, um, couldn't be, and it was a new recording because it's a digital recording, actually. So this is from the late 80s, I guess. Uh, $3.69, that's totally unheard of. I, I think CD singles were even going for more than that at the time. And so this is my first classical CD I ever bought. So I had to pull this out, load this in the computer, and give this a listen. Even though water music is one of those things that uh, people don't even realize they know uh, that aren't even classical fans. They've heard it because it's been used so much in various places. And while I was digging around, too, um, I had to pull these out because uh, recently my good buddy, Carm, um, you know, I always think I can't make videos. Uh, you know, if I ever attempted to make a video uh, of something that I think Carm doesn't have, it would never work. And this is one of those things because um, I had these CDs. I, I didn't mention them at all by this composer. And, and you know, I, I totally came across them by accident. Piero Malesi. Uh, who, who passed away, but but um, apparently he did more more uh, film music than his own albums. So he doesn't have a lot of um, his own albums out actually. And I only have two CDs by him. Uh, looks like they're from '86 and '82, possibly. Uh, one was recorded in 1980. It's hard to tell because um, these both were recorded a number of years before the CDs were actually released, uh, before the music was released on CD. 
So I want to say that most of these, the, the two I have, looks like they were recorded in the 80s. Don't know if they ever came out on an album. Um, now I'm thinking about it. I think Carm showed an album. Yeah. Uh, was it this one? Yes. The Nuclear Observatory of Mr. Nanoff, which Carm showed on album, which I never knew even came out on vinyl. Uh, and I was blown away when he showed this because I knew I had these in my collection somewhere. And I knew someday I was going to show them. And I was thinking, man, nobody's going to have any of these CDs or know who this guy is. Because I only came across him totally accidentally. And I think I bought one of his CDs because it was uh, it was on sale for like an incredibly cheap price as a clearance thing. And, when I, and, I, and I love the title of the Nuclear Observatory. And um, I bought it, and it's quite good, kind of minimalist, I, I guess almost like a, um, a smaller Steve Reich or Philip Glass ensemble kind of music vibe at times. Um, and I didn't think I would show this to anybody had ever heard of this guy, and then Carm pulls out just a, a few videos ago, maybe a few months ago. Carm pulls out a, a vinyl, which I didn't know existed, of this album. Blew me away. And again, this is why I don't make, this is why I will never make a video of things I don't think Carm has. Uh, unless it's something I record myself. Um, and here's another album I bought after after that because I, I did find his music um, quite enjoyable. And he's, uh, he, it seems like he's only got a couple other albums. This one is called Modi or Madi. Um, and this one was recorded in 1980, but didn't... Uh, I don't know if this came out on album, and this is a later reissue of 70, uh, 94 on Cuneiform Records, as the Nuclear Observatory is also on Cuneiform. But if you uh, like uh, the Terry Riley... Um, smaller ensemble work of Steve Reich or um, Philip Glass, uh, but not um, not as repetitive. I think he's only got a couple other albums that were recorded as, as actual just music albums, and then there's other things that are uh, strictly soundtracks to films he did. Um, but Carmen, if you don't have this one, this this might be one worth seeking out. I think there, I think there, he might only have one other album that was actually recorded just uh, as an album of his compositions and everything else is a soundtrack. Good music. And I came across this. Now here's, um, this is a, a quote, unquote, new age compilation. I'm not a fan of most compilations, and I forgot to pull one of them too. Um, not a fan of most compilations. I tend to buy them for a couple of reasons. And one of the reasons is um, sometimes they have tracks on the compilations that are unique to that compilation that, you know, some of the artists uh, recorded tracks specifically for that compilation that aren't on their own. And this was the case. There's two reasons I bought this again, and I'm admitting to this. Um, I bought it because there's several tracks on here by the artists uh, that aren't on their own albums or weren't. I, I think some of them got released later on. There's also a couple artists I wasn't familiar with, which is always good. I got it for a reasonable, very reasonable closeout price because it's from, uh, I want to say the early 90s, part of a series that's out of print. I know this copy is used and new available very cheaply on this one I last checked a few weeks ago. And it also has uh, a great cover, and I got suckered in again by the cover, which I love that, uh, love that artwork. I wish I had just that, you know, artwork there, an enormous poster. I love that. That's called Inner Landscapes Volume 3, and there was at least... Two other volumes. I want to say I think there was a volume four. Um, the other three volumes are pretty much so far out of print, they're impossible to get. Uh, it's got uh, one track by Kit Watkins, the keyboard player, that's actually from one of his albums um, called Azure something or other. It's a track that I actually have. The only one that I actually had um, so far. Uh, but there's a John Surrey track, which is unique to this compilation. Now, it's possible that Surrey uh, may have since added um, this track onto one of his own albums or, you know, a co I don't know. He's, he's done his compilations. Uh, that I'm not sure of, but at the time that I first picked it up, it was unique to this album. Uh, two musicians I wasn't familiar with, but I actually quite like. Uh, more in the acoustic mode. Uh, I know there's like an acoustic guitar. One track is basically acoustic guitar based. Uh, and, and the two, the two guys I was completely unfamiliar with are more acoustically based. Uh, one guy is Steven Van Handel, which is not, no one I've known, and Sandor Zabo, which is another person I don't know. Those two are kind of uh, acoustic oriented tracks. And I have to admit, it, it's a very listenable album, but it doesn't flow together incredibly well. 
uh, like you would expect. Uh, you kind of expect that with a compilation album uh, versus a single artist album, but it's not so out of context that it, it jars you or it's like, oh, that doesn't fit in there. It's just that all the other tracks besides those two I just mentioned by two composers I wasn't familiar with are electronic keyboard oriented for the most part or very electronic sounding oriented versus um, a kind of more acoustic, almost world music, new age kind of thing. Uh, there's not a bad track on here, but the styles are a bit jarring because you start off with... Um, the Kit Watkins, which is all electronic keyboards, and John Surrey, which is electronic keyboards. And then it goes to two to two kind of acoustic-oriented tracks, which is a bit jarring. And then it goes back to the electronic stuff. Um, but it's the whole thing is listenable. It's very enjoyable. Um, there's also two tracks by Laraji on here, which were unique to this album, that I'm sure to this day aren't on any Laraji albums because he doesn't put out a lot of albums and he hasn't put out a compilation uh, album of his own that I'm aware of where he would take these tracks and kind of tag them onto a compilation album. So there's two Laraji tracks on here. There's also two Steve Roach tracks on here, which were unique to this album at the time, but I'm fairly sure that Steve Roach has put both of these on some uh, albums of his. He had a series called Lost Pieces, and I believe the two tracks from here he did put on Lost Pieces. Um, but still, this is a budget thing. You can find used and new copies fairly cheaply. At least the last time I checked, you could. And it, it's a great introduction to some of these artists. And the, the two acoustic-oriented artists I still to this day don't have anything else by. But I would, you know, look into buying something by them um, that I know nothing about. I've never even heard of them, Stephen Van Handel and Sandor Sabo. Um, oddly enough, the address for this record label is in New York. Surprised me. But it's nice. Uh, Selected New Music, Volume 3, Inner Landscapes. And like I said, there was a series. I think there was Inner Landscapes 4 as well. Um, but just from judging from this one, I would definitely, if I could get those other discs without, you know, paying uh, a fortune for I don't even know what artists are on the other discs. It would have been a nice series to have the whole thing by, but um, it was already out of print by the time I discovered it. This is 10 years ago or, or more, but I love that cover. Um, so I gave that a spin lately. Um, and I have to, uh, uh, I have been listening to the VCLT and I, I did mention that um, Andrew had sent me eight CDs. But one that's particularly is not surprisingly, probably if you know me, getting a lot of spins is um, the Wergo CD that I showed that he sent me, uh, the digital computer music by multiple artists, um, avant-garde, avant-garde, and as a matter of fact, the first half of it is pretty much acoustically oriented with just some electronic treatments, but it's exactly the kind of thing that I'm digging on uh, in terms of, you know, kind of getting ideas from my own music, because most of it is acoustic oriented, at least the first half of the CD versus just the electronic stuff. And it's pretty avant-garde stuff, but using traditional acoustic, uh, classical orchestral instruments. That's a very interesting, very good album, which I would probably have. I love this series, but whenever I see them, they're kind of expensive to pick up. And uh, then I was extremely bad, and I spent money. Um, and I'm, I'm probably going to do reviews of the, the CDs, the next few I'm going to show you. Um, but I can't really do an intelligent review of them yet because I haven't listened to them enough. But just the other day, I found out that um, Dirk Mont Campbell, that um, I did an entire video on his music from around Tower album, which was something that uh, originally was recorded and came out in the mid 90s. Uh, and I mentioned how I had seen that in the record stores when it was a new release. And I didn't pick it up, though it looked interesting. And then I couldn't get a hold of it. And it took me um, until this past Christmas to find it again. So it was uh, 20, oh, almost 20 years um, for me, because I think it was originally came out in 96. And uh, it just, you couldn't get a hold of it. And, and when I saw copies of it, they went for ridiculous prices. And all of a sudden something happened and they started, some copies started um, surfacing late in autumn last year kind of expensive, around $20 for a single CD. Now, oddly enough, there's more copies at a much cheaper, like, standard single CD price. Um, but that was an album very much kind of like a world music, I want to say, 
done by Mont Campbell, who is known as a bass player and oddly enough French horn player for bands like Egg. Uh, he's from the whole Canterbury scene from the late 60s, early 70s. He kind of left the whole progressive Canterbury scene years ago and started studying world music. And that's pretty much when he records now all he does. And I like that music from around Tower, and that's just one of those discs that I kind of like went chasing down. And then a couple weeks ago, I read that he did a follow-up fairly recently, in the last couple of years. So it wasn't, um, I'm looking for a date here. He mentions it in the book. There's a lot of notes in the book, which I like. Um, he says, okay, uh, music from around Tower was 96. And sometime in 2009 or 2010, he started writing a follow-up, which I had no idea about, because it doesn't show up. You can't, uh, you won't see it pop up on Amazon, unfortunately, called Music from a Walled Garden, very much in the same vein as Music from a Round Tower, um, very much acoustic, uh, using a lot of instruments that you, you or I have probably never heard of, especially wind instruments, unusual horns from different cultures and things like that. Very much like the music from Around Tower. And I'm probably going to, you know, I, I have to really absorb this and get into this a lot more than the couple listens I gave. It comes with a nice, that's a nice picture there, um, nice detailed booklet in here that he writes about the inspiration and the instrumentation and stuff. And I guess the reason that I wasn't aware that this came out, because this has been out for a few years now, um, is because the only place you could get it is from Burning Shed UK in England. Apparently no import copies have made it over here, and he records for the Burning Shed label, and um, they have really no distribution here, but I'm surprised that you couldn't even buy even expensive import versions. Couldn't find it anywhere, even looked on eBay. Um, so, And I don't think the music from Around Tower uh, was... No, that wasn't released on Burning Shed, so that was a lot more readily available than this. This, I had to pretty much order from the UK, from England, and the exchange rate isn't great right now either, I will say. And I was just going to order the single CD, but with postage and the exchange rate that was really bad, I, I wanted to try to make it a little bit more worth my while. And I found out that they actually had a budget section on Burning Shed where they were letting go of some of their things for fairly reason, like less than half price. And I thought, man, that, that, that one, that one Mont Campbell CD is going to cost me a lot of money and I'm going to pay for shipping anyway. So two of the things that they had on budget were two Roger Eno albums that you can't get here as well. They're also on Burning Shed, uh, both from the 2000s, 2009 period or somewhere around there. Uh, maybe 2000, maybe as far back as 2002. They're essentially solo piano albums. One's called Anatomy, and the other one is called Fragile Music. Um, and again, if you look on Amazon here, and I even think I looked on eBay and everything, again, no copies are making it over here. And because they were budget releases, and then, you know, I'm semi-familiar, I, I think I covered some of Roger's music. Um, it sounded like they would be kind of like Harold Buddish, they're primarily acoustic piano, but they're treated, uh, but it, it's not treated as much as Harold Budd's piano, which has a, a lot of reverberation, or Harold o often uses uh, electro electric piano, which he heavily treats. This is more acoustic piano oriented a little bit, but there are um, what sounds like synthesizers playing along very quietly on some of the tracks in the background. I wouldn't say it's as good as Harold Budd's music. I'm not sorry I bought it, though. It's probably better than um, almost, I, I think the Voices album that Roger Eno did, which is very well known because it was released here in the U.S. in like 85, um, is probably better. And that's probably his best known album. Certainly in the U.S. it got released here multiple times. Um, and this is pretty obscure because, like I said, you can only get it from Burning Shed in the U.K. And I think these were less than half price. And so I bought them. I'm not sorry I bought them. Um, cause in the end for three CDs and the, you know, with the exchange rate and the shipping from the UK cost me about $39. Um, and that's probably not a whole hell of a lot more than it would have cost me just for the, uh, Mont Campbell CD on its own. So, you know, I kind of made the purchase a little bit more worthwhile, you know, it still averages out, I guess, to about the standard CD price, but these are interesting. I have to give these more listens. Um, but, um, Maybe not as good as uh, there's some some nice notes in these some some brief liner notes in here 
Uh, one of the albums was recorded, and it's interesting that Roger would mention this, uh, during a very difficult uh, period in his life, uh, emotionally. Kind of interesting and nice that he would include that those facts. Um, and um, that's what I'm going to show. I bought some. I bought some um, compilation classical CDs too. Um, I think I might save that for next time because you know I, I don't know. I, I've got. Um, I'm going to be listening to those a lot more, and um, I'm sure I'll be able to. You know, it's probably going to be e easier for me to do when I don't have a real video to do on a single artist. Um, I'll probably do one of these. Here's what I've been listening to lately, kind of things. And since I just bought, I bought a five CD set of classical music, various artists. So maybe I'll show that next time. But that's a lot of what I've been listening to, guys. I don't know if any of that's really interesting to you or not. Um, but you know, hey, I wanted to, to to put something up. So this is it. Um, I'll be back. I'm I'm gonna try not to let a uh, such a long gap go here, and I have no excuse for it. So um, hope everybody's having a great week. And I will be back soon. Take care, everyone. Bye.